Hi, and welcome everybody to the Winter Circle Sports Betting Channel. My name is Ross Benjamin, host of our podcast. And like every Monday, I'm joined by Mr. Doug Upstone of DocSports.com. We're here to be discussing some college football action that will take place on Friday. Doug will be looking at the Oklahoma State-Kansas State game. I'll be looking at uh, the Nebraska and Illinois matchup. A couple of uh, less than desirable matchups, but they're being played on Friday, and they're the only two games on the card. So we're going to try to give you some help in that regard. Doug, how are you? I'm doing well, Ross, and uh, nice football weekend. I, I can share with everybody as for yourself as well. Uh, nice NFL 2-0 should have been 3-0, except for a two-team teaser in which I had uh, Philadelphia minus the three, which lost on the last play of the regular. It didn't lose, but it made it a push, which made it no play, alt or ended yeah, up being no yeah. play, you know, from that standpoint. So it should have been 3-0, but it wasn't. So we, we move on. So, yeah, two straight winning weeks in the NFL. Uh, best bets hit both of them. So it was good. I'm pleased and happy and uh, excited good for the for beginning you. of baseball, the playoffs. Yeah, me too. Me as well. Four big games tomorrow we're going to be uh, addressing uh, in terms of our premium paid selections. Doug's on a nice roll right now in Major League Baseball. Myself as well. We'll discuss that later. Just a friendly reminder, folks, we are sponsored by Gambler's World. And uh, you can get a ton of the finest handicappers in the country right now at gamblersworld.net. No, Doug's not there because he's under contract at Docs, and you can find – uh, Doug's great picks over at DocSports.com as well. Uh, we guarantee all our picks. So if uh, and when I say guarantee all our picks, let me specify uh, all single game and multi game daily packages and all subscription plans of 30 days or less. Uh, if you don't win, you don't make a profit. We will credit your account back the exact amount of your purchase price, and you can use that any which way you like on any handicapper you like at any time you so wish. So uh, you're not pressured into using it the next day or sticking with the same handicapper if you don't want to. So can't get much better than that, folks. And hopefully uh, when you do make your purchases, um, it's a moot point. And I'm, uh, I'm confident that on majority of occasions, that will be the case. Anyway, uh, also, uh, our live show on Friday, we will be going live at a different time uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern time. We're trying to accommodate the people on the West Coast as well, because we have been shooting at 1030 a.m. Eastern time and uh, sort of early for the East Co West Coast guys. So. Uh, it'll be noon Eastern time, uh, noon West, uh, Pacific time, excuse me, on the West Coast. And uh, I'll be joined by, as usual, Jesse Shule and Sean Higgs for that show. And folks, you can chime in with all your comments, questions, and we'll get right. We'll get to as many as we can, time permitting. All right. So looking forward to that as well. Anyway, Doug, um, Brandon Staley off to his uh, old tricks yesterday, and once again he gets away with murder. I don't know how much. What you know? My question to you is: He's got lucky over the last two weeks. Um, if that luck wasn't quite as well two weeks ago, and then yesterday as well, I, I think he's out the door, especially with a team of uh, that he has, and it's just mind-boggling again. He goes for uh, a fourth and one play uh, from inside his own 30-yard line, holding a better than a touchdown uh, uh, lead in the game for the second consecutive week. Doesn't make it, but his defense bails him out. Your thoughts again? I, it just, I, I, like yourself, the first person I thought of was you, as, as you thought of me, okay, from that standpoint, because we're in 100% agreement on this. Um, but as I said in, in the what I said, uh, texted you, I said, you know, this, at least this guy's consistent. I mean, he's going to keep going for it. And, and as long as his team finds a way to bail him out, you can't say he's wrong, even though in theory he's a hundred percent wrong to, to do that. But it, it has, if it doesn't cost you, I guess, you know, uh, I guess what does it matter? But it's still, it's just mind boggling to, to do something like that. And if not for the, Really, either the fault of uh, O'Connell, the uh, quarterback for the Raiders, and literally staring the receiver down, 
and or the, the really nice play on a read by uh, Asante Samuel to see what was happening. I mean, they would have scored. And I mean, any if it, even if that happened, the way this guy's luck has gone for the Chargers, they probably would have won in overtime. OK, so, so something. Well, that, actually, it would have pushed because they were six point favorites. But the, that's just how it goes with this guy. So I you know, you run out of things to say. I mean, he's just. It, they're stupid decisions and they work out for them. So I, I, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's well, they didn't work out for them on a couple of occasions in recent seat. And oh, no, no, years. not at all. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, and uh, right now I would say there's a fine line between uh, losing your job and keeping it. And he's sort of uh, straggled that line. Yes. Um, and uh, Again, you mentioned Aiden O'Connell throwing that interception yesterday inside the 10 yard line. And a week before, he gets bailed out when Kirk Cousins throws an ins- interception inside his 10 yard line on a first down play besides. So, uh, again, uh, you have to look at things realistically. Yes, it's a results business. We get mm-hmm. that. But uh, you're teetering on disaster with some of those decisions. And sooner or later, it's going to bite him in the behind like it has in the past. And the Chargers management, upper front office and ownership, really, really look at the situation and say, is this going to be in our best interest going forward? We'll see. Uh, the Miami Dolphins uh, came in on a high yesterday. They go into Buffalo, coming off a 70-point output the week before against Denver um, and look just terrific in the first three weeks of the season and they ran into a buzzsaw yesterday quite simply put you know and um the bottom line is they came out of the shoot dog went yeah. right down the field on their first two drives and uh then the game the whole complexion of the game just changed and then they had to abandon the run which really hurt them because uh yeah. once they abandoned the run uh and, and Tua was a sitting duck yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was just, I don't know. I don't know if you uh, had the game or not. I had Buffalo yesterday and it, and it seemed, you know, relatively simple. I would have never guessed the score would have been like that, but you know, yeah. it, it, it just seemed like it was a great situation for Buffalo and a poor one for Miami. And then like I said, they, they, you know, they lost their center the week before they lost their tackle uh, one of their tackles uh, yesterday. That didn't help, but you know, let's face it, their defense isn't that good. And so it, it got exposed by a red hot quarterback with a really, you know, they kept talking about it, but it is absolutely the truth. I mean, this team now can run the ball and they can play a different style of football than what they did before their defense. If anything seems better. Okay. A a little more consistent. Sure. They gave up a few early touchdowns, but against Miami's offense, that's not exactly uh, news from that standpoint. So no, I mean, uh, it, it sure seems like it's going to go through Buffalo right now uh, to, for the team that's going to uh, win the AFC. Um, I mean, maybe Kansas City will end up winning more games, but uh, even Kansas City last night, you know, I mean, they're I mean, they're winning, but yeah. not overly impressive. You know, and 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 why should they be overly impressive each and every single game every single year? I mean, you know, that's just, the NFL. It's it's yeah. not college football. It's the NFL, and uh, every week takes on a whole different entity. Um, you know, they say on any given Sunday and it, it's with, you know, a few exceptions, that's ultimately <laughs> the truth, you know. So, yeah. but no, I didn't have Buffalo yesterday, but I was quite pleased with the result, needless to say, because uh, being from Western New York, uh, a big concern for me, though, is the loss of Tredavious yeah. White, who went down for with a season ending Achilles injury yesterday. Just feel bad for the kid. I mean, he, he took a year and a half to get back from a, a torn ACL. Uh, by all accounts, the guy keeps his body in great shape, uh, is a workaholic, very loved within the locker room, and just hate to see that for anybody, not just because it's my team, but also we're talking about uh, one of the top 10 corner cornerbacks in all of the NFL, uh, and uh, he's going to be hard to replace, and, and we'll keep an eye on that going forward. On a positive note, it looks like Van, Von Miller – uh, maybe coming back this week at the very latest in two weeks. So that'll be a welcome addition. And the Buffalo pass rush has really, really turned it on over the last mm-hmm. couple of weeks, uh, amassing 13 sacks in the last two weeks. Doug, the Duke-Notre Dame game, um, another one of those classic thrillers for the second week in a row for Notre Dame. Uh, and give Notre Dame credit. 
uh, look, this is a team that was coming off an emotional, and, and I mean gut-wrenching loss the week before to Ohio State on, on virtually the last play of the game. And uh, they bounced back. And it looked a little shaky there for a bit because they jumped out to a 13 nothing lead. They got down 14-13. to uh, but they ultimately scored uh, a touchdown in the last 30 seconds, much to a lot of people's chagrin because they were in field goal range and uh, their running back broke one off for a touchdown. And then just an exasperating way to end the game for Duke. Not only did they lose the game, but Riley Leonard gets hurt on the last play of regulation time. And uh, let's hope for the best from him. I, I don't know the updated report. I haven't looked into that yet. Maybe you could share uh, if you know. But anyway, your comments in that regard, Doug. Yeah, uh, what I saw is a high ankle sprain, probably multiple weeks. But that's about all that's being said. You know, and in college, they don't, they're not as, uh, uh, let's just say, open about no, how those injuries no. are and what goes on. And, you know, whether it's rightfully so or not. But here's my here's my thought, you know. Hartman did a great job in the on the last drive. But you know what, Ross? Here's what I was thinking in the fourth quarter. And by the way, hats off to the coaching staff, the Notre Dame coaching staff, how they had that team prepared. Okay. Yeah. They had a great game plan to start with. They were super aggressive. They did everything right. But then after those couple of drives, it just settled into kind of doing nothing. And I, you know, and whether that's the offensive coordinator, whatever it is, I can tell you this though. At, when the score was 14 to 13, Duke was ahead. The first thing I was thinking of late in the fourth quarter was Sam Hartman was not brought to Notre Dame to score 13 points against Duke and 14 points against Ohio State. He wasn't. Okay, simple as that. So it's really good that you know they put some big numbers up against some other you know competition, but in these key games of which Notre Dame you know annually plays several. I mean, you got to perform, okay? And whether that's yeah. all on Hartman, whether it's on the offensive coordinator, where it's whether it's on the uh, offensive line, you know, there's blame to go around. But ultimately, it's going to come to Hartman. And I just don't think he has played as well the last two weeks. And it's not like we haven't seen this at Wake Forest before. I mean, you yeah. know, again, better competition. He sometimes struggled against it. And so, from well, that you know, in Wake Forest, though, the burden was solely on him. Right. Um, I, I agree with you to a point, uh, but my my uh, retort to that would be that at Wake Forest, the owners, you know, the, the, he had to carry the team on his shoulders. Right. Uh, they were a pass happy team, uh, very predictable in that right. He wasn't surrounded with a great defense or the quality of people he's got in the backfield now. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So much different situation. And to his credit, I know we mentioned that we we often bring up when Sam Hartman is one of our recollections is both of us having North Carolina State against right. him, against Wake Forest, and him throwing interceptions on six consecutive possessions. Uh, again, a result of him having to do too much and feeling like he had to play hero ball all the time. I think he's yep. playing within himself right now. And uh, I don't know if he threw an interception against Duke. I can't recall. But I know I going into the – Okay. So if indeed he did not throw an interception against Duke, he's yet to throw an interception in five games. So it's not like he's costing him, Doug. Right. Um, and there, you know, he's also playing to score. I mean, his defense, uh, he, he doesn't, he's making smart decisions in the respect that um, he's trusting his defense. He's playing complementary football as opposed to what he had to do at Wake Forest. Again, right. we'll see. It's a very good point you bring up. Uh, and, and I hope you can understand how I could defend him in that regard oh, as well. Oh, no, no. I, I mean, I, I'm just, I mean, I, I like him. I think he's done a good job. I just think that they're, you know, in these key games, and again, there's two more on tap at Louisville this week and against USC the following week. I mean, I, I you know, again, I just don't think that amount of points is going to uh, lead to two more victories. OK, I, in fact, I'm yeah. very confident to say that, you know, uh, so so that being the case, you know, he's I think he needs to up his game as do his teammates. OK, and uh, and also maybe some of the play calling, you know, there's there's I mean, there's always something to look at in terms of play calling. Everybody everybody agrees on that. Uh, yeah, it just he needs to up his game. If if this team wants to reach his potential, I think he, along with his teammates, has to play better. 
I guess maybe that's the best. Absolutely. Way Absolutely. But uh, we'll see. I mean, the level of competition was stiff. Um, yes. Ohio oh, State's going to make a lot of offenses look bad, right? You know, so right. and, and uh, playing Duke on the, ro- uh, on the road was not an easy task, especially coming off that game against Ohio State. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I liked your chances against USC for sure. Uh, I, I just, <laughs> I mean, look, USC is going to score, you know, but Notre Dame's mm-hmm. a good defensive team, Doug. They've shown that uh, yeah. against Duke and Ohio State. Notre Dame could run the ball and control the clock if they have to. They got a veteran quarterback. USC's defense stinks. I'm sorry. For oh, as good does. as that team is and how they're rated, I mean, they're giving up a ton of points. Would they give up 42 to Colorado? The week won, before, yep. he gave up 28 to Arizona State. Um, you know, it, it, sooner or later, your inability to stop people on that side of the ball is going to catch up to you. And I think that's a good matchup for Notre Dame. Now, at Louisville this week, you're talking about the third toughest, toughest on uh, three tough games right in a row. Um, mm-hmm. But I think they show the character and mentality of this team. I personally believe this is the best Notre Dame team I've seen uh, in a few years now, at least. It, it, and that's my personal opinion. I think they have an excellent chance, if they run the table, to be in the, in the playoff. Uh, I mean, look at If you beat Louisville and you beat USC and then you go on the road and beat Clemson later in the year and you don't stub your toe in a game that you're supposed to win, um, there's no reason why they're not going to be one of the four teams at the end. What are you going to do? Penalize them for losing one game in the last second yeah, I, in the last seconds against Ohio right. State? You know, I, I wouldn't think so. Right. Oh, I I agree with you. I mean, if if they if they win out, okay, they should be in. And when you look around at what what you see with everybody else, you know, I it just there's you know there's everybody's got some flaws more so, and yeah. and even Georgia does. I, I don't know if I, I'll take one minute here to talk about Georgia. Sure. You know, and, and looking at and watching that game from start to finish against Auburn and, and seeing them, you know, in other games, the one thing that I'm noticing that's different is that the sense of urgency is lacking, especially on defense. You know, I mean, their defense has just been shut down completely the last two years. Oh, sure. They had a couple of games, you know, where they gave up 20 some points here and there, but you know, whether it be, you know, different situations, but I mean, but I I just don't see that same urgency. Now it it seems like the talent's still there, just not the urgency. It has not, you know, and of course you can't keep winning like how they've won for forever. I mean, that's just not going to happen, but you know, it's just, I mean, they were, they were there to be taken by a better team this past week. No question about it to me. Yeah. And you know what, that was an Auburn team coming in. Um, that when I discussed that game last week, I don't know, I don't think I discussed it with you, no. uh, but I was having a hard time fathoming how Auburn was going to score in that game because, quite <laughs> frankly, their offense had been atrocious yeah. up yeah. until that point, with all things considered, right, Doug? Right. Uh, oh, even in the games that they were uh, had superior talent against some inferior opposition, it's not like they were an offensive juggernaut in those contests. And you're right. I did mention, I still think Georgia's a very good defense. I still think they're extremely talented, but they're not as dominating as they've been on that side of the ball. And and again, offensively, uh, it's left a lot to be desired as compared to past Georgia teams. So we'll see. I mean, again, we're nitpicking, right? The team is still undefeated, still number one in the country, still a back-to-back defending national champion. So again, I think our expectation level, we – tend to believe they're going to be more dominant. And, you know, I went with uh, Georgia last week on a free pick, and I said I'm doing this reluctantly because I don't understand why this came from 16 to 14 and a half. So there's something up that I don't know. And quite frankly, that's exactly what occurred. Something was up that I didn't know, and it came to fruition. In any event, let's get to our games, Doug, both on Friday evening you're going to look at Kansas State at Oklahoma State. Uh, right now, uh, Kansas State's an 11.5-point favorite, a total 55. Kansas State coming off uh, an impressive win, uh, rebounding from that Missouri loss. And uh, they're going to be facing an Oklahoma State team, in my eyes right now, isn't very good. And I say that 
from watching them from week one of the season. They left. They're not the Oklahoma State teams uh, that we've seen in years past. And uh, boy, oh boy, uh, that loss of Spencer Sanders st- certainly hurt them as he transferred. And now he's not even starting. He's a backup quarterback at Ole Miss. Anyway, it doesn't matter what I think. What do you think about this matchup? Uh, well, first of all, I think that the juice is out of the program at Oklahoma State. And Mike Gundy's best years uh, at, at, in Stillwater seem to be behind him. Now, he's made waves in recent years, uh, saying some things that are pretty abrasive uh, in, in a lot of different areas. Uh, he's, he's certainly come across as extremely arrogant. And, you know, that just it hasn't translated to where I think he, he actually thought he was going to get either a lot more money where he's at or he's going to get m- money and a better job someplace else, which hasn't turned out to be the case. And Gundy's teams for years were known for high scoring teams, great, uh, you know, running backs, wide receivers, at least good, uh, solid quarterbacks. And, you know, the, the number of players they sent to the NFL, you know, each and every year was fantastic. But that process has dried up. Take Consider this right now, Ross. This team is averaging 22 points per game, and they have played Central Arkansas, Arizona State, Southern Alabama, and Iowa State. If you just take the FBS teams, those teams right now are five and ten. Now Kansas State, you know, uh, they're going to come in three and one, well, like Oklahoma State. They got, have a had a week off last week, and they should be ready. Uh, K State offense is really good with Will Howard averaging uh, thirty nine points per game. Fifth, they're fifteenth in total offense. Defense is not quite as good. Uh, their numbers look good uh, when you when you look at them. Eighteen point five points per game. But in their last two games against better offenses, which were Missouri and Central Florida, they gave up 30 and 31 points in those two games. Now, the thing about Oklahoma State that I'm noticing is their quarterback play is really substandard. They've played three different quarterbacks, including uh, Gundy's son uh, in this one. But I think the one that's going to give them the best chance to win is the one that played the last game, and that's Alan Bowman. Now, if that name sounds familiar, well, He was the starting quarterback basically for three years at Texas Tech from 2018 to 2020. He transferred to Michigan, never won the job, sat sat on the bench for basically two years. Uh, Now he's over at uh, Oklahoma State. Hasn't been particularly accurate. He's only hitting 53% of his passes. But the one thing he is is a good deep thrower, which is the weakness of the Kansas State defense. Now, to me, Kansas State, Ross, seems like an easy choice of uh, minus 11, minus 12, whatever the number is or going to end up being. But, you know, I was curious, and I did my power ratings before I did the show, and they came up with the uh, Wildcats at either minus 9 to minus 10. The other thing I'm going to consider here is that last year, Oklahoma State lost 48 to nothing at Manhattan. Ross, this is crazy, and you could easily disagree with me on this one and i wouldn't i wouldn't really have even much of an argument but i'm going to take a flyer on gundy and oki state here 24 and 14 off a road loss 17 and 8 off a loss if it was seven points or more i'm going to i'm going to take the te- take the you know the the points i can see oklahoma state losing somewhere right around 10 points that's what i'm going to go with if it ends up being 20 ross and that's who you like i i, I can't say you're wrong <laughs> that's for sure well, it, it certainly looks like a situation that's too good to be true with Kansas State. Um, they look far to be the better team in this matchup. Yes, that's a lot of points to lay on a road in conference, but Oklahoma State hasn't shown why uh, this line shouldn't be where it is. I will say this. This is another yeah. one of these situations similar to the Auburn uh, Georgia game last week where I, I see the opening line at 12. Now, not quite a big difference like that that line jumped uh down a point and a half to two points by game time uh this opened at 12 and quickly has now gone to 11 and a half today uh which tells me there's a little bit of sharp money because i can't imagine that uh normal betters or public betting is lining up at the window to take oklahoma state plus the points on a monday morning here so, uh, yeah, there's some validity to what you're saying. And basically, it's a very fishy, uh, fishy line, fishy line movement. And uh, I can't disagree with you totally at this point. I'm not saying I'm going to go with Oklahoma State or rule <laughs> right, out right. going the other way. But at this point, uh, you make a compelling case for being correct in this in this game. So, again, we'll see what transpires there. 
Uh, the other game on Friday night is Nebraska at Illinois, and this is a real stinker. And uh, But, you know, it's the only two games on the card on Friday, and uh, I know a lot of you out there are going to want to bet either one or both of these games, and we're going to do our best to put you in the winner's circle, with no pun intended. Uh, Illinois right now is a three and a half. There was a <laughs> there you go. No, no, there was. Me, no, 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 no. You're not fooling me. <laughs> go ahead. That's great. Anyway. Couldn't, couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> never, never be hesitant to do so, Doug. Anyway, uh, Illinois is currently a three and a half point home favorite. The total in this game is 44 and a half. Look, this is an Illinois team, not the same as last year. Uh, they're not defensive. Uh, last year, they were a very good defensive team. Uh, their defensive coordinator has since moved on and taken a head coaching job elsewhere. Uh, but Illinois, two and three straight up right now, and they failed to cover in all five contests. Uh, their only wins have come both at home uh, against Toledo, 30-28, to a game they were very fortunate to win as a seven-point favorite. And then they struggled against FAU, uh, winning that game 23-17 at home and not nearly covering as a 16-point favorite. This is also an Illinois team uh, that through five games uh, is a minus six turnover differential, and they're averaging 22 turnovers committed per game. You wonder why they're own five against the spread. You wonder why in the two situations they were a favorite, they didn't cover. Well, that's a major contributing factor right there. Nebraska now, uh, look, I'm not going to try uh, to, to put a bow tie on a pig here. And, and I don't know what other analogy to use, but uh, hopefully the Nebraska Cornhusker fans don't hold me accountable for that statement because it's not meant to be personal. But the Cornhuskers are two and three straight up, same as, as Illinois. Um, and they're coming off a 45-7 to seven drubbing at home, but they face number two Michigan. Uh, and Illinois is not nowhere near in the class of Michigan, by the way. Uh, boy, there's a bold statement. Um, the first time in five games they allowed more than 58 yards rushing was last week against Michigan and Michigan's going to be able to run the ball on a lot of teams they face this year. Uh, Nebraska also, uh, they run the ball very well. I mean, uh, they've they've had 181 yards rushing in four of five games this year. They averaged uh, around five yards a carry last week against Michigan, but they had to abandon the run because they fell behind early, and they fell behind by a lot. Um, the Illinois rush defense, they've al allowed 164 yards in four of their five games this year. So Nebraska, in my mind, is going to be able to run the ball here. That's going to keep the game competitive throughout. And the uh, one bugaboo for Nebraska over the last few seasons has been really shooting themselves in the foot with turnovers. And uh, after the first two games, it was like, here we go again. The Cornhuskers turned the ball over eight times in the first two games. Uh, they blew a seven-point lead. Uh, with uh, less than two minutes, with less than three minutes to play in regulation time against Minnesota to lose that game 13 to 10. Uh, but ever, however, uh, over the last three games, the Cornhuskers have only turned the ball over just twice. Um, and uh, they're going to be able to run the ball here. Illinois is not in the same class of offense uh, of neither uh, Colorado or Michigan, uh, which were the only two teams that really torched the Nebraska defense. I like the court Oscars here. I'm going to take, especially with getting the hook at three to three and a half, uh, I'm going to take Nebraska here, plus the three and a half, Doug, over Illinois. Well, to uh, to borrow something you've used before, Ross, this has all the makings of a stinker, okay, <laughs> from that standpoint. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's it's it, you know, it, it's a bad football game, uh, but somebody's going to win. And if you want to put, if you want to polish up uh, that pig a little bit on this one, here's here's something to consider. It's actually an important game for both teams looking at their schedule because the winner is going to be three and three, which still keeps them in contention to be bowl eligible. I don't yeah. know that's going to be the case for the loser, okay, from that standpoint. I don't see where they're going to win four of their last six games to become bowl eligible. So th that being the case, so th from that standpoint, it's a big game for both teams. Now, it's not, a, not exactly a, a ringing endorsement either way. Here's the thing. Everything I, you just said, Ross, I agree with. Nebraska has the superior 
uh, running game. Uh, they are they're better at stopping the run. Illinois mediocre. We have two teams that have transfer quarterbacks that are basically no good. Okay, they have limited skills. Yeah, they move the ball here and there, but they're pretty limited uh, in, in each case. So from that standpoint, the other thing I'd like, <coughs> excuse me, to add is Illinois. They are 0 and 9 against the spread as a home favorite after they just gave up 40 or more points and they gave up 44 to Purdue. So I'm with you, Ross. Even though Scott Spritzer's from Nebraska, Scott Spritzer from from Flax. <laughs> I'm from Illinois, okay, and actually we're going to be talking about this game later today. I would recommend taking the points with Nebraska for the one of the reasons of what we talked about and the uh, angle I just gave out from that standpoint. There you go. So we agree on that one. Nebraska uh, plus three and a half at Illinois on Friday night. Doug also likes Oklahoma State uh, plus the 11 and a half at home against Kansas State because we both think this is a pretty fishy line. Uh, but it's still early, okay? So uh, I might change my mind one way or the other. You never know. Uh, but anyway, Doug, tell the folks how you've been doing of late. You, you briefly mentioned uh, you had a good day in the NFL yesterday. What else is going on? Major League Baseball playoffs coming up starting tomorrow. And yep. I know you finished on a real good roll at Major League Baseball as well. Yes, uh, on the, uh, the to end the season, the last eight weeks finished 57 and 35 altogether. So that was a, a nice uh, run to finish the season. So that was good. But I love the playoffs. And, I don't, and I'm the first to admit this, Ross. I used to be just terrible in the playoffs. I, 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 had, I, I think I approached it wrong. And in the last two years, I, I, I actually made a couple of decisions uh, in terms of how I handicapped the playoffs to, to change things up. And so with that, the last two years, 22 and 7. 76 wow. percent okay uh the last two years uh, pro- yeah profit 2700 you know not big bets just occasional here and there primarily just a lot of just you know shorter plays and stuff but just looking to try and find winners and it's been and it's worked okay from that standpoint so uh hopefully that can continue there's no reason to think it it should but at the same time there's no reason to think it shouldn't either at the same time so that that was been really good uh, I know we're, uh, we're going to, uh, we don't do many videos about it, but I know we'll be talking next week about hockey. You know, okay, so that's been coming up. That starts next Tuesday from that standpoint. So that's good. And uh, so, like I said, I did well in football over the weekend. And uh, I, I let it go last week, but I'm going to bring it up today. CFL winner, my friend. Okay, no problem. 12 and 7 on the season. So here we go. Ross, you can take it away from here. And your baseball run to end the season. I don't. Did you mention that? If yeah, you 30, did, I think uh, fifty-seven and thirty-five. Correct. There yep. you go. Terrific, Doug. Very good. And again, you can find Doug's picks over at DocSports.com. Doug will be back with us on Thursday, along with Kyle Hunter. We'll be discussing uh, some pretty attractive matchups that time around in college football, as opposed to what we discussed today. Uh, but in any event, you could find me over at gamblersworld.net. And folks, um, I don't know what adjustments I made. And like Doug always used to say when he was red hot, I'll say the same thing. I can't explain it, but I'm on fire, folks. And, uh, I, you know, I'm not trying to put a star on my forehead. I'm not trying to be arrogant, but numbers don't lie and liars don't figure. I've gone, I'm on a 38 and 12 all sports run right now. And that's since. September the 12th. Uh, I'm 16 and three in college football the last two weeks. Uh, my NFL and college football combined uh, 26 and eight, 77% run. Uh, NFL this week, four and one with uh, the Monday night pick I put up uh, pending. Um, Major League Baseball playoffs, like Doug just alluded to. Uh, right now, you can get any of our handicappers over at gamblersworld.net, including myself, $199 for the NBA or MLB postseason package, which includes games right through the World Series. And if you don't make a profit with that package, you're going to get $199 uh, credited back to your account. I could tell you I'm not planning on anybody getting credited back to their account because Major League Baseball, like all other sports, Done awfully well down of late, 13 and four with my last 17. And since August the 4th, my Major League Baseball picks are 41 and 20. And that's good for 67%. And folks, 
my return on investment is very good in Major League Baseball because I do not give out big favorites, as Doug knows. Very seldom will I cross the bridge of minus 140. Now, I'll make exceptions to that rule during the playoffs because uh, the games are much more in terms of a lot at stake. And also it's limited cards, limited amount of games. So there might be a time or two that I make an exception through the postseason, but normally that's not the case. And my ROI has been terrific in Major League Baseball. So um, a lot of good stuff, Doug. And uh, don't forget, folks, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, take a second to do so. If you're on your PC, you'll see a WC logo right in the bottom right-hand corner of your video box. Just click on that. And if you're on your mobile device, which most of you are, statistically that shows up in our back end. So uh, I would tell you there's a black subscribe button underneath the video box. Just click on that. Cost you absolutely nothing. There's no strings attached. There's no hidden agenda. Absolutely free. And I'm going to ask you just to do one small favor, one step further. Once you subscribe, or if you have subscribed and you haven't taken care of this, you need to. Go into your YouTube settings. There's an alert notification bell there. You click on that and for the Winter Circle Sports Betting Channel, and you're going to be notified immediately upon us publishing any of our podcasts here on our great sports betting uh, channel, which is the Winter Circle Sports Betting Channel. And uh, did I forget anything? Yes, the like button underneath. Doug, what do you want them to do with the like button? The, I, I tap it real fast. That's what I do. Yeah. I just keep tapping keep it tapping real it. fast. Keep tapping yeah. it. Make sure you tap it, whatever the case may be. Just a small token of your appreciation for the work, time, and effort we put in to putting out a quality product on all of these podcasts and to make you a smarter sports better today than you were yesterday. I will be back tomorrow morning with Jesse Shul and Sean Higgs discussing more college football games at that point. But until then, for Doug Upstone, Ross Benjamin, take care and God bless, folks.